Colossians. We've been in this series now for a couple weeks, and uh, we're going to spend some time in here, kind of leading up towards Ash Wednesday. Uh, The book of Colossians, a small little book in the Bible, but man, it's been loaded with some good stuff, and I hope that it's been blessing you like it's been blessing me. I love to teach the stuff that God is teaching me the week prior. I always feel a week ahead of you. Does that make sense? Because my hope is that you take today's message and chew on it and run with it and struggle with it the rest of this week. Well, that's what I've been chewing on and struggling with all this past week. Does that make sense? So Colossians, this this has been good stuff, not only to like share because I think you need it, but I've needed it. I've needed it. Here's the deal. Colossians, the church in Colossae is a young church. It's a young church, and Paul has in, in, he's, he's, Paul is very, um, he's concerned about some of the things he's seeing. He's encouraged by some of the things he's seeing. But last week, what we really saw him focus on is that Jesus is God, especially laying out how Jesus is the creator and redeemer. And, and did you kind of see that last week? And, and, and it was cool getting some feedback around just thinking about Jesus as God, which is really what Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20 was really pushing there, pushing this idea that Jesus is the God who created you and redeemed you. This is something, for example, even today, this is just a little side kind of added bonus for you being here this morning. Uh, Even like those who are of the Jewish faith today, Making the connection that the Messiah is God is very key because the Messiah, like Jews today, see the Messiah, coming Messiah, as probably, I mean, there's different kind of filters, but a lot of times more as a guy who will be a political kind of ruler of sorts, connected with some special power and such. But, but when we talk to, to Jews to make the connection and show that, the, like especially in the Old Testament, God says, I myself will come and be their shepherd. I will come to redeem them. That's really key because this then is the claim that Jesus makes. He's God. The fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Jesus. That's considerable. We've got to think about that. We've got to wrestle with that. And that's going to drive not only today's message, but it's going to drive the rest of Colossians, actually. Uh, Paul puts that idea of Jesus as God at the front, at the front of the whole book, so that we might wrestle with then some of these things Jesus is saying to us, not as just a nice guy, not, you know, I I shared that quote from C.S. Lewis last week, Jesus doesn't leave that to us to be able to say he's a nice guy. We can't think that. Either he's a fruitcake or he's God. That's kind of what you get to choose between. Does that make sense? I hope that kind of makes sense a little bit last week. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you got to go listen to last week's message. Let me pray for us, and then I'm going to try to break down today's message uh, that Melissa uh, shared with us especially looking at Christian, this is the way it kind of broke down in my mind, Christian suffering and Christian maturity. It's kind of a two-point message, and I'm going to kind of walk through those two ideas, Christian suffering and Christian maturity. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll dive into that. But let me first pray, if that's okay. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity today. Really, an opportunity Uh, There's a lot of people in this world that did not wake up this morning. I got to wake up, and I'm amazed by that. And a lot of us got to wake up, and we're thankful for that. And God, I guess this morning, um, I just pray that you would help us to take advantage of your patience as you patiently are waiting, (laughs) as you patiently wait to grow us in the faith, Uh, connect others who are not connected to the faith, connecting them to the faith. You're so patient with us. And so I just pray this morning we would engage this time, not only with our ears, but also with our hearts, that we would hear and listen to what you would be trying to say to us this morning, speaking to us as a community. So what are the things we need to be hearing as a community? And then what are the things we need to be hearing as an individual? Or, Or maybe our family? What does that look like? 
Whatever it might be, speak to us clearly this morning, God. And so I pray that you'd help me to speak those things that you want said clearly. Just kind of keep that bit in my mouth and pull me wherever you want to go. And I pray this boldly in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Christian suffering and Christian maturity. Let's just kind of take Christian suffering, for, exa- for example. Um, where are you, here's just a kind of basic setup question. Where are you suffering on somebody else's behalf? Where are you suffering for someone else? Uh, we don't sleep anymore because of a little baby who cries in the middle of the night. Okay, some of you maybe don't see it that funny, but here's the deal. Uh, you know, when a baby wakes up and you've got to wake up to go do whatever you got to do, that's kind of a suffering on somebody else's behalf, right? Now, let's be honest, Jackie does that a lot more than I do. That's just the reality. Uh, but a suffering on behalf of somebody else, do you suffer? Uh, have you ever suffered for somebody? You ever pay somebody's bill? Any of, you, any of you have teenagers? I mean, are you people uh, alive this morning? Do huh? you have a teenager? You have to ever suffer on their behalf, right? You're paying the bill and they're having all the fun? Yeah. Uh, you, ever, you have a coworker where you're doing all the work? Oh, now all of a sudden, everybody's tuning in. Oh, yeah, okay, this message is for me. Okay, yeah, yeah. You know, you're getting paid the same, but you're doing all the work. You have to suffer on behalf of somebody else or some, you know, jack wagon b- boss or something, right? You ever have to suffer for someone else? It's interesting. Here's the, here's the text. Paul says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And then a little bit later, actually three different Greek words are used here, but in verse 29, I don't have it on the screen, but he says, for this I toil, struggling, struggling with all of this energy. And then again in verse 2, no, verse 1 of chapter 2, for I want you to know how great a struggle I have. And that's three different Greek words that that have a, a suffering side to it, that has a struggle or competing side to it, like a competition, like I'm laboring, okay? And some of these words kind of, but it all kind of means the same idea of just struggle, for you. Paul is saying here at the, at the onset of this kind of message, he's saying, I am struggling. I, I am willing to suffer the things I'm suffering for you. So what is Paul suffering? Let's just ask that question. What's he suffering? Well, Paul is suffering a bunch of different things. Right off the bat, we hear in chapter one, he says, I'm suffering by, well, he doesn't connect it to suffering, but, but uh, there's a little bit of conjecture in here, okay? There's a little bit of conjecture, but I want you to follow this line of thinking. Early on, chapter one, he says, when I heard about you guys, we've been praying like crazy for you. We've been praying like crazy. Have you ever prayed where prayer has become a kind of suffering? See, if you said a prayer, if you said one little prayer for something, that's not suffering. But when you've been praying for three decades for something, and you're on your knees every night for that person, or for that particular situation, or for that whatever, See, all of a sudden, and Paul says early on here in Colossians, he says, man, I've been praying for you guys. I'm praying like crazy for you guys. He's suffering that. There's a kind of suffering that's happening there, a kind of suffering that he's having to undergo as he's suffering for them. What else does he suffer? Well, one thing, he's in prison. He's actually in prison at this time of this writing. So, and, and listen, he's not in prison because he shot a guy. Right? He's in prison for the gospel. Have you ever met somebody? I've met one person that I know personally. I sat next to him at a conference who's been to jail in another country for the gospel. Uh, this conference we went to a couple months ago down at Exponential, uh, literally I sat next to a guy and the, I was introduced to this person and it was told to me. I mean, I don't, they could be lying, I guess, but I don't know why they'd lie. Uh, but that I was told that this guy sitting next to me, he didn't speak very good English or anything, but, but a little bit, we could talk a little bit. 
he had been in, in prison, and I can't remember the country now, for the gospel. Not because he did something wrong or committed a crime, for telling people about Jesus. He had literally sat in a jail for months. That was, man, just being in that guy's presence was like, oh, whoa. That was cool. That was cool. Hello, mister. You know, <laughs> it was just cool. It was just like, ah, oh, let me shake your hand. That's just something special about that. And Paul here is in prison for sharing the gospel because he's telling people about Jesus and he's having to physically suffer um, persecution. And I could go through a whole list of things that Paul had to suffer for the sake of the gospel. What else does he have to suffer? What is the other kinds of sufferings he's undergoing? Well, another kind of suffering that I was kind of thinking about is, is the, the, the fact that he has to suffer um, the training of leaders. Epiphras, the guy who planted this church, um, he, you know, Paul, and again, there's a little bit of conjecture here. This isn't like directly from the text. But, but as I've kind of entered into this text a little bit this past week, I can see it. Paul here has never been to Colossa. He's never been to this town as far as we know. And a church has kind of arisen. He's got Epiphras, the pastor who planted that church most likely, with him. And I could envision Paul being like, oh my gosh, how are we going to set that church up for success and a future and, 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 and kind of growth and all this kind of stuff and to keep them from being polluted by the cultural stuff that's being spoken into their lives? How are we going to be equipping and raising up leaders? And it's interesting. I personally feel that in this area, living on kind of this northeast side of Houston, as, as our church looks to plant more churches and start more places where the gospel is getting proclaimed, in an area where there's literally hundreds of thousands of people on this north side, literally hundreds of thousands of people, and nobody, no developers, no anything is saying the local church is needed. Nobody's saying that. The people who are coming aren't even saying that. You don't even have, guys, it's amazing to me. What's amazing to me is how even people who have gone to church like, and made church their, their lives, like it's part of who they are, when they're doing some of these moves into some of these communities, they're not going to church on Sunday morning. They don't see a need for the local church. I find that fascinating. We don't, have, we don't have people coming into, our, uh, into the dwelling every Sunday morning who are just new to the community, just kind of new to the area. This area is growing like crazy. People don't feel like there's this incredible need for the church. Heck, some of us have started to feel that. Do I really need the local church? And Paul as Paul, just imagine this, the God, Jesus just died on a cross and rose from the dead just a couple decades earlier, and now Paul is trying to take on not just the little north side of Houston, he's trying to take on the entire world at this time, and he's trying to say, how do we get churches into these places? Who the heck is going to fill the leadership void? How are we going to raise up pastors and leaders and evangelists and apostles? I mean, Paul, Paul has got to be just, is he sitting there in jail sitting in jail. Paul's got to be thinking like, oh my gosh, if there's one solid missionary out there, it's me, and I'm sitting here in jail. I mean, the burden that Paul has for the entire Roman world at this time, the burden he has for churches that are like, like the church in Philippi, or the church in Thessalonica, or the church in Corinth, and he has such a burden. He actually suffers. There's a kind of suffering that happens when you have that kind of burden for people. And it might be a neighbor. It might be a friend. It might be a family member. It might be a whoever, a coworker. You ever feel burdened? Do you ever suffer some of those things? Could be cultural suffering. As he sees a culture that's speaking into, as he sees a culture that's speaking into a church that's new, a brand new church. And he's like, oh my gosh, the kinds of cultural struggles that they're going to be up against is crazy. 
Gnosticism is a big deal. I've, I shared about this a couple weeks ago when I set up uh, the, the, the church in Colossa. This is a real struggle that's going on at this time. And it's not, it's not like full-blown like you see in the fourth, third, fourth century and stuff, but it's, it's creeping in already into the local church where special revelation is needed, more knowledge is needed. You know, you, don't, you need to know some more stuff. Um, special revelation, uh, you, you got to have the right passwords. Okay, that, I'm pushing that. But you, know, you have to have the right knowledge or information before you can be truly kind of transformed or any of those kinds of things. That's what he's dealing with. And he senses, he senses that that's creeping into the church in Colossa. And that's all he can do is write a letter and send it to him and say, oh my gosh, guys, I am suffering. I think about you guys so much. I care about you so much. I am suffering for your sake. And I actually think Paul is also suffering some of his own. This is conjecture, but I think he's struggling himself in the, what the culture might be speaking to him as well. I mean, he's definitely transformed by the gospel, but you can't tell me Paul didn't struggle with, maybe this isn't worth it. This is going to be hard. I mean, this is, gonna, this is an uphill battle. Even when Paul gets converted one of the things that Jesus tells Ananias, he's going to suffer a lot for my name. And Paul does. He suffers a lot. See, the Christian life, the Christian life is a, see, when, when we're Christians, guys, we will suffer. And in fact, and I want to show this to you, there's a connection in this to our baptism. Go to, and I screwed this up with where I wanted, but I want to start with Colossians 2, verse 12. I want you to just see this quickly, okay? Look at this. Colossians 2, verse 12. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. Now, just follow me here for a second. <clears throat> When we're baptized, we're baptized into Christ's death. This comes out in Romans chapter 6 really clearly too. Uh, look at, I don't, have it, I don't have it on the screen, but I just, I have to share this with you. Galatians 2 verse 20. Listen to this. I have been, this is Paul saying this again. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live, in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I have been crucified with Christ. In my baptism, I'm buried with Christ. Now just follow me here. Colossians chapter 1 verse 18. Jesus specifically says here, or Paul says specifically, that Jesus is the head of the church, right? He's the head of the church. And then, okay, just keep these things together. Now let me say this. In Acts chapter 9, when the apostle Paul gets converted, his name was Saul, he gets converted to Paul. I want you to see this. I want you to say, see what Jesus says to Paul on the road to Damascus, okay? Acts chapter 9, verse 4 and 5. And he said, no, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, this is Jesus talking, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now that's fascinating. Why doesn't Jesus say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting the church? Jesus has already ascended to the Father. Why does he say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, because Jesus is the head of the body, the church. And so when the church is persecuted, Christ is persecuted. And Jesus himself makes the connection. Do you see that? When you suffer, Christ suffers. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He's the head of the body. All I'm doing is saying this. That's all I'm doing in that little two-minute segment. All I'm doing is saying, as Christians, we will suffer. Various kinds of trials, Peter says. Various trials. I had somebody this morning come up to me and say, man, I don't know if I've ever suffered. 
Well, I like the thinking there. That's really good thinking because um, there's various trials. Yeah, when I'm suffering by having to get on my knees and pray, I'm not suffering in the same way that the guy over in some prison who shared the gospel with somebody and is now sitting in prison is having to suffer. I get that. And that's fair enough. And we've got to keep our suffering in perspective. Maybe sometimes it's just an inconvenience. Fair enough? Some churches, that'd be an amen, but that's okay. So what are the kinds of trials that we will suffer? What are the kinds of things we might suffer? Well, let's talk about a couple of those things. One, uh, one, one thing you might suffer is demonic uh, attack, spiritual attack. Uh, some of you have, have wrestled with this, and you know exactly what I'm talking about, where demonic stuff has attacked you, and you've experienced that, you've felt that, you know that to be true. You've maybe said things even like, man, how do I shake these demons out of me? How, how do I shake this away from me? You have been under spiritual demonic attack. That's the kind of suffering that sometimes we have to undergo. Um, the world and its suffering. So sometimes you have to suffer because we live in a broken world. And so when you open the news up and you see all the garbage that's there, sometimes we're suffering because our, our world is broken. There's wars, there's rumors of wars. Well, you're like, that. I didn't do that. That's not me. Well, sometimes we suffer because of the consequences of just being and in, in living in a broken world. Or our cultures and its teachings or our culture and the way it thinks about things and the consequences that come from those decisions. Sometimes we have to experience or we have to, we have to, we have to suffer then what that looks like. So maybe you put a guard on your internet and you're like, man, I never made a choice to put crap on the internet. Well, sometimes you have to suffer what that might look like to put a guard on your internet for your kids or your family or whatever it might be because you... You're suffering the crap of other people. But suffering isn't just from outside. Sometimes we suffer the stuff from the inside. So sometimes it's demonic. Sometimes it's the world. Sometimes it's our own heart. So sometimes our choices can lead to consequences that we have to suffer, right? I mean, I think of the choices that I've made in my past and Some of, listen, those things are forgiven, but I still have to face the consequences that come from those things, and I still might have to even suffer with those consequences, right? There should be a lot of amens on that one only because I know you experienced that one, and you've you've even thought about that one because you can, you know that. Um, and then, and then there's suffering for others. And this, this is, I, I, there's probably even more suffering that we could talk about. Those are the three that jumped out at me. And then I want to talk just a little bit about this more. This idea of suffering for the sake of others or struggling for the sake of others. It seems like Paul is saying here, listen guys, I want you to listen to what I'm saying to you because I'm actually struggling on your behalf. So where, where are you called to maybe struggle on somebody's behalf? Do you pray? Do you pray that a coworker would come to faith? Do you suffer that? Do you suffer what it might look like to, to have to build a relationship with an enemy? you suffer that? Or do you run away from it and fall into what our culture says to do, which is avoid suffering at all costs. Make sure you feel good. Do you suffer what relationship building might look like? Paul's never met these people. He didn't have to write a letter. Why does he care about them? I don't even want to get to know my neighbor. I don't even want to get to know my coworker. I don't want 
could do the kind of work that it would take to make that happen. Do you suffer any of those things? What does suffering on behalf of someone else look like? How about calling somebody out? Have you ever had to, oh man, I'm, man, I'm talking to me a lot this morning, sorry, but have you ever had to call somebody out? You ever have to suffer? See, you've never thought about it like this, but have you ever had to suffer going up to somebody and saying, what you're doing is not what we're called to do from God's word. And you can come as you are, we're a come as you are church. We want you to come as you are. But I have to speak now what God's word has to say to you, to me, to all of us. And what the way in which you're living isn't a biblical, that's not, how, that's not what we're called to live. Have you ever challenged somebody on that? I'm thinking of a situation where, where I pulled a guy aside and I had to tell him what he was doing was wrong. That's not fun. And I can remember times where I was pulled aside and I was told, you're not thinking about this in a biblical way, Seth. Those aren't fun times. I had to suffer. There's a kind of suffering, a kind of gut. Oh, shoot. I'd rather just stay home and watch TV. I don't want to suffer that stuff and, and step out and say, man, you really shouldn't be living together before you're married. I don't want to have to say that. I'm not excited about telling people that. I'm not saying my sin's any less than yours. No, no, no. In community, those are the things that we should be doing because we live under grace and forgiveness and so we can confess it like we did at the beginning of the service which so often we treat just kind of like, yeah, whatever. No, no, it, that's, the, that's our life as Christians. We're broken people. We confess it. We throw it out there. We lay it out there and we receive God's forgiveness. But we might have to challenge people. We might have to suffer through some of that. Or are you just doing the culture thing, avoiding suffering at all costs, and thinking, no, anytime I'm engaging suffering, then I must be doing something wrong. I'd say it's the opposite. Man, where is suffering potentially being used as a catalyst for God to be working? Look at, the, look at what Paul says. You missed it the first time it was read. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Has that so far, have you been spoken to by our culture so much that that's receded from your mind? See, one of my concerns is that here in the West, we don't have a good idea of what suffering really is. And I actually think if you study, if you study the past 2,000 years of what Christians have had to endure it concerns me how little we're willing to suffer. And I, I wonder if I'm speaking even to myself here. How little are we willing to suffer? So, okay, I, I was struggling with whether or not to go here or not, but let me just go here for a second. So somebody that's born with a particular tendency, let's say, to change their gender. Let me just get really specific. Now, I'll be honest with you. In something like that, in a situation like that, that is an incredible struggle for that person. Incredible. And that is not a suffering that I have to undergo. Seth Kunze does not struggle with that. I don't I have zero struggle with that. This particular person does have a struggle with that. That is so hard. So what does it look like to suffer that? What does it look like to come around somebody and help them suffer that? We, we don't even know what we're talking about today because of how much we, we don't suffer. Do you see what I'm kind of trying to say? That's just really real. That's a particular situation that I know about where, where the, the, the person is really struggling. It, it's, this is a Christian person. They're a Christian and, and who's challenging them is they're actually challenging, challenging them in connection to suffering. This is something you may just need to suffer. To be obedient to God's word, even though it's contrary to feelings or, or struggles. And that's sad for me because that's hard for me because it's like I don't struggle with that one. I struggle with other stuff, not that one. 
And all of the struggles I struggle with are way less than that particular person's struggles, in my opinion. So how are we as the church going to come around somebody who's got that kind of struggle, that kind of suffering that they're called to undergo? What are we going to do? Yeah, love them, walk with them, of course. My question is, do we even know them? (laughs) You know, we say we want to love them. We don't even know who these people are half the time. I'm talking about me here. I'm not even being mad at you. I'm talking about me. And then he rejoiced in his sufferings. He rejoiced in his sufferings for them. This isn't to say suffering is good. This isn't to say we should try to go find suffering. This isn't to say if you're standing in the middle of the road and you're going to get hit by a car, you shouldn't step out of the way. None of that stuff is what I'm talking about. If you can avoid suffering in a certain sense, yes. But but in another sense, I think sometimes we're called into it. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. Jesus says stuff like, they're going to hate you. But remember, it's not because they hated you first, they hated me first. Jesus says, this is, this is all through Scripture. God's people are going to suffer. Various trials, Peter says. Various trials. That's very key. Some of you will not be called to go to prison and get your, you know, be killed for the sake of the gospel. And that's a good thing. I'm thankful for that. Some of you will not have to undergo that. Some of you may. We might have to go through various kinds of trials. But in the Christian life, when you've been baptized, you've been baptized into Christ's death, and we're baptized to all that, uh, so that we can be baptized into the Easter stuff too. Do you see that? We're baptized into the death and burial and connection to his suffering so that we might also be connected to glory and resurrection stuff. That's good stuff. I mean, that's, that's good stuff. Okay, let me move on to something else here real quick. Christian suffering, and then what does it look like? Christ, what does Christian maturity look like? What is Christian maturity? What is maturity? When I think of maturity, I think of immaturity. And when I think of immaturity, I think of me in my minivan trying to beat um, off the line people that pull up beside me like in their big trucks And they just, you know, they're in this like $50,000 pickup and I'm in this like $1,500 van. And beating those guys off the line is just so much fun to me. That's just fun to me. That's so immature. But I still get a kick out of that stuff. You know, because I'll be in my minivan and I'll just be like, and you know they want, because, you know, their their truck's made for towing, their truck's made for all that stuff. It's not for, like, no, my minivan can take your $50,000 pickup. And I do on a regular basis. It's so fun. That's immaturity. What is maturity? What is maturity? What is, the, the word here, I, gotta, I can't remember. I have it written down here real quick. The word is tell, yeah, tell us. Tell us. Uh, no, that's a P. No, that's a T. I, I wrote it down in Greek. And I'm not always good at reading Greek. Tell us. Um, the word that you see there in verse like 28, I think it is, or 29-ish, that word has a, a feeling to it of like completeness or perfection or doneness, maturity, arrived at the end, okay? I want to present you mature. I want to present you completed. Perfect might even be the word. Um, what does maturity look like in the Christian life? It's interesting. Look at some of these words. I just put them up on the screen and I underlined them. These, these, all, these are all saying kind of different things, but I think it's kind of saying the same thing, which is that Paul wants, to, he wants the Christians at Colossae to become mature in the faith, okay? So just look at, look at some of these with me. Um, he says, filling up. I want to fill up you. Um, I want the word of God to be fully known among you. You see that? Fully known among you. Um, I want the, 
I want to talk about the riches of the glory. Kind of as, as a switch in analogy there, but riches. I want you to see how wealthy and rich of the glory. I want to present everyone mature, which is interesting because back in Colossians 1, it talks about Jesus presenting us holy. And it's amazing that Jesus brings us into this, this uh, ability to present people present people mature in the faith. Reach all the riches of full assurance. Do you see that up there? All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Notice that. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. See, as I look at that, I think to myself, this is Paul saying, I want you to know the fullness, the allness, the richness, the wealthness, the maturityness, the completeness, the perfectionness. I want you to have it all. What is that? What is that? See, that's what we're all kind of waiting for, I think, as we're growing in our faith. Or we're like, okay, when have I arrived? When do I get there? When is, what does mature Christianity look like? And then look at, now this is going to just kind of annoy some of you. This will annoy you. Look at verse 27. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you. And then, chapter 2, verse 2, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance, full assurance of understanding and the incredible knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. It's Christ at the start, it's Christ in the middle, and it's Christ at the end. <laughs> this is why sometimes when we baptize a little baby, I'm like, there's a picture right there of maturity. Jesus says, unless you become like one of these, well, baptized, not thinking, not doing nothing, just pooping and peeing. And Jesus. Let that sink in, because there's actually more powerfulness there, in, more powerfulness, uh, than, than maybe kind of meets the eye. I mean, it's Christ. See, when we come to Christ, or Christ comes to us, a lot of times what we think is we think that the struggle now is Christ and that kind of gets me going and that, thank you Jesus for kind of starting the, starting the motor, but now I got it, man, I'm going to have to do a whole lot of stuff through life and I'm going to have to add so much stuff. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa wait a second. What if it's Christ? What if, what if it's, what if it's, G see, this is why it's so important to know who Christ is. This is why last week's message is so important. Christ is the creator, the redeemer. It's not just Christ like a nice guy who teaches some good stuff that could maybe kind of fire up you and get you kind of pumped up about loving people and caring for people, but then it's all on you to go make that stuff happen. What if it's Christ plus a bunch of stuff equals confusing nothingness. And what if Christ plus nothing equals everything? What if that's it? <laughs> what if it really is about Jesus? What if it really is about him? What if it, see, the, the, the Gnostics at this time, and Gnosticism as it was kind of, is it's working its way into the church, which we're going to pick up on over the next couple of weeks. They think more knowledge is needed. They think secret kind of revelation is needed. They're like, yeah, Jesus is fine. Jesus is good, but... And Paul comes in here and he lays out from the get-go. No, God in fullness dwelt in Christ... Jesus is God, the creator, which is clear in that text, and the redeemer, which is clear in that text. And now he is the one 
who is even the fullness. Look at 1 John. Look at 1 John chapter, oh shoot. I'm far away from my, maybe 3 verse 2? Yeah. <laughs> Look at this. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. Uh, that's a little bit of struggle, suffering, struggle. I mean, I'm conjecture there. I get that. But look at this. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. That's, if you were to say, Jesus is at the beginning of my salvation, then say also, Jesus is now in the king of my life, and say, at the end, it's all about him. You know what I'm saying? Beginning, middle, end. It's all Christ. And full maturity is actually not the person who just has Jesus and then adds on all these other things. Bible study, go to church, do, 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 all the other stuff. See, that's what we think of as maturity. Maturity is actually Christ and him directing you. So it's, it's just him directing you. Now I'd love, I'd love to be told a story where Jesus is directing somebody to isolate themselves and just be alone and not connect with anybody. I'd love to hear that story. I'd love to hear somebody say where Jesus is leading that person to anything that's contrary to his word. I'd love to hear that. You're just not going to find it, ever. So my point is simply, how do we guard ourselves? How do we guard? What is? What, how do we guard ourselves, guys? As we're walking through, as we start to slip and fall, as Paul is struggling for them, he's suffering for them because he's like, "Oh my gosh, you are up against our culture. You are up against the world. You're up against the spiritual forces of evil. You're up against your own heart." up against so much. So how do we guard ourselves? Let me just throw out three thoughts. Christ alone. Lock on to that baby. Hold on to that with everything you got and never let it go. Paul's willing to go to jail for it. Never let that go. Christ alone. The word of God and our lives being directed by it where God speaks to us and leads us and guides us. And then this last one, and see, even you might be thinking, well, isn't the word, of, like the Bible, doesn't, isn't that Jesus plus? Isn't, and then community I got up here, isn't that Jesus plus? No, no, no. Because what you'll find is that God's word is always pointing to Jesus. And what you'll find in true Christian community is a community of people always pointing to Jesus. It's all about him. So I throw those two last ones up there as just a kind of helpful way to think about what are the ways in which I can remind myself that it's all about Jesus. We need that. As we walk through life, we have to have places where we are reminding ourselves and I'd encourage you to do it every single day. When you wake up in the morning, the kinds of things like, I am a child of God, telling each other, creating a culture in your small groups where you remind each other whose you really are. You're Christ's. Are you in places, are you being reminded on a daily basis by yourself and by others whose you really are? Because it's all about him. He's died for you. He has saved you. He's made you. He is the eternal God who loves you like everything. He was willing to suffer. <laughs> he was willing to suffer. God, who... He suffered for you. Hanging on a cross, suffering your sin, suffering your hell. So that we actually wouldn't have to suffer that. Wow. Wow. And 
as we're drawn into that now, in our baptism, in our faith in Jesus, as we are drawn into that kind, now we suffer as Christians. What does that mean? Where am I maybe called to be suffering right now? If I can step out of the way of the car, yes, step out of the way of the car. But where am I maybe suffering something that I'm supposed to just be suffering right now? Or maybe where is a suffering that I've been trying to avoid that God is calling me into? And maybe full maturity isn't isn't so much about adding things, but what if maturity is actually walking through life putting to death, putting to death the stuff that so often emerges and reminding ourselves that actually it's our baptism that drowns that stuff out. That, I would say, is Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ and I don't even live anymore. Christ lives in me. What if some of the suffering we actually undergo, I'm not saying all, I mean, this is a whole other message, but what if some of that suffering is actually sometimes God using suffering to get the edges off so that it's Christ? You know what I'm saying? I'll let you kind of go with the rest of that where you need to let the Spirit lead, but... I think I'm done. Let me pray. Lord, I don't like to suffer. I know that. Uh, you don't like to suffer. Jesus, when you are, when you're in the Garden of Gethsemane and you're praying, Father, take this cup from me. Is if there's a different way, I'd rather go the other way. And sometimes, Father, you say, just like you said to Jesus, you say, No, this is the way. God, this is a hard message because what's so hard is sometimes it'd be easier to just not do what you want. And and when it's easier to not do what you want, it probably will feel better. It'll probably seem better. But we know it's not better. So God, I just pray that you would help us in our suffering. Thank you that you are with us, that when we suffer, you suffer. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Thank you that you know what we're going through. And you're walking with us through that, Lord. Strengthen us, Lord. Strengthen our faith. Continue to grow us in our maturity. Continue to grow us to listening to your word being drawn into the places where we are on a regular basis reminding ourselves of whose we really are. We are yours, God. Help us with that, Lord. Help us with that, all of us in this room. Myself more than anybody. Please help me with that, God. To not think of maturity as knowing more information or having the perfect practices in place and God, help me and help me grow in my maturity that I just have you be king. You lead and guide me. Please help me with that, God. Help all of us in that. I pray that boldly in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.